When we think of inventory, we usually classify it in terms of where it occurs in our process. We talk in terms of raw material inventory, work in process inventory, and finished goods inventory. Although this classification is useful for many purposes, we need to look at inventory in terms of how best to manage it. When we say managing inventory, we are implying that we want to reduce or even eliminate the inventory and still get our job done. That is, we want to produce the same output but use smaller quantities of inventory to run our processes. What does that mean? If I want to reduce my inventory, can't I just easily toss out a bunch of stuff? No. If I did that, there would be a price to pay. There is a reason why I have the inventory lying around. If there were no reason, I would have tossed it out a long time ago. Before I can start tossing out any inventory, I need to first eliminate the reason for the existence of the inventory. Let us say I look in my refrigerator and I'm appalled at the amount of stuff that I have in there. Among other things, I have so many gallons of milk that are occupying so much shelf space. So I decide that from now onwards, I will keep only one gallon at a time. Suppose my family consumes one gallon of milk every day. Given my new inventory policy, how often will I have to run to the grocery store? Once every day, of course. It suddenly dawns on me that the reason I have so much milk sitting in the refrigerator is that I have chosen to go to the grocery store only once a week. It saves me time and effort by doing my grocery shopping once a week. Also, I have found that weekdays are not really convenient for grocery shopping, so I batch everything until the weekend. Unless I can get rid of that reason for my inventory, I need to get used to seeing a refrigerator full of milk and other stuff. As you can see from this example, I can conduct the process of feeding my family milk using different amounts of inventory. The process outcome will still be the same, that is, my family will get one gallon of milk every day. I can conduct that process by purchasing one gallon at a time, or two, or three, or four gallons at a time, and so on. I can also conduct the process by purchasing one week's worth at a time. I can also conduct that same process by purchasing one month's worth at a time, except I'm not sure who'd want to drink that old milk. Using the same principle, say I am conducting a retail process that produces $100,000 per month of sales. I can conduct the process using $200,000 worth of inventory. I say that my inventory turns over once every two months. Using a quicker replenishment cycle, I can conduct the same process using only $100,000 worth of inventory with inventory turning over once every month. Using an even quicker replenishment cycle, I can conduct the same process using only $50,000 worth of inventory, with inventory turning over twice every month. Each of these options comes with its advantages and disadvantages. I need to compare these different options and see which one makes the most sense for me. I cannot simply decide to get rid of inventory without getting rid of the underlying reason for it. The kind of inventory we have seen in the above examples is called cycle inventory. If my grocery shopping cycle is once a day, I purchase one day's worth of milk at a time. I start the day with a full gallon of milk and end each day with an empty carton. So, on average, I have half a gallon of milk in my refrigerator. If I increase my shopping cycle to once in two days, I purchase two gallons at a time and use it up over a two-day period. I start my two-day cycle with two gallons and end with zero. So, on average, I have one gallon of inventory. If I increase my shopping cycle to once in three days, I purchase three gallons at a time. I start my three-day cycle with three gallons and end with zero. So on average, I have one and a half gallons of inventory.
and so on. The larger the inventory cycle, the larger the amount of cycle inventory. In general, let us say I buy a quantity Q of some item that I need for my process. I use this item over time and deplete the inventory. Just as I hit zero, I replenish my inventory with a fresh order of quantity Q. I keep repeating this sawtooth pattern, which is the classic inventory cycle. Although at different points in time during this cycle, the inventory will vary, the average amount of cycle inventory is equal to Q divided by 2. To reduce the cycle inventory, the obvious solution is to reduce the cycle. Before we can reduce the cycle, however, we need to reduce the reason for the long cycle. With my milk purchasing, if I want to change from a weekly cycle to a daily cycle, I need to think of a different kind of arrangement. Perhaps I can use a grocery store that allows me to click and purchase while I'm still in my office. Soon after I get home, my daily grocery delivery arrives with one gallon of milk, four apples, and two bananas. Or perhaps I can set up a neighborhood program where we hire a high school student with a car to do micro grocery shopping with home delivery. For a nominal price, if we email our daily grocery lists before 3 p.m., the items will be at our doors by 5 p.m. Now all we need is a reliable teenager and some critter-proof containers. Let's think about a typical purchasing process in a large corporation. The cost of the paperwork to complete a purchase order can easily run upwards of $100. Say I need 20 pens per day for my department. Each pen costs $1. If I buy the pens on a daily basis, $20 for the pens plus $100 for the paperwork comes to $120 for 20 pens or $6 per pen. Instead, if I buy the pens on a weekly basis, $100 for the pens plus $100 for the paperwork comes to $200 for 100 pens or $2 per pen. If I buy the pens on a monthly basis, $400 for the pens plus $100 for the paperwork comes to $500 for 400 pens or $1.25 per pen. My costs are reduced if I amortize the $100 ordering cost over a large order size, so I am inclined to order larger quantities less frequently. However, such an ordering pattern increases my cycle inventory. Suddenly, my company institutes a new system. Instead of putting in a purchase order, I simply click on a web page and order two pens. Meanwhile, in the next department, you order three erasers. Someone else orders five paper clips, and so on. All these orders are electronically compiled and sent to our pre-qualified stationery supplier. And every afternoon, a delivery truck arrives with all the day's orders. The cost of placing an order is now in the range of pennies, not $100. So I can even order one pen at a time without breaking the bank. As we can see from this example, to reduce my cycle inventory, I first reduced my ordering cycle. To reduce my ordering cycle, I had to start by reducing the cost of placing the orders. The same principle applies if I am producing something instead of buying it. In this case, I want to amortize the cost of setting up a process over a large production batch. Suppose I produce something for a whole day before changing over to something else. It takes me one hour to set up the process, after which I run it for the rest of the day, or seven hours. My utilization is 87.5%. Instead, after setting up the process, if I continue producing the same thing for the rest of the week, 
or 39 hours, my utilization increases to 97.5%. But now I have produced a larger batch of items that are going to sit around unsold for a longer time. To reduce the cycle inventory, I need to reduce the batch size. In order to do that, I need to first reduce my setup cost. Another option is to look for similarities in the different things that I'm producing. I can identify groups and dedicate a separate line within my facility for each specific group. This dedicated line has greater repeatability of the same work, which minimizes the need for elaborate setups. Therefore, cycle inventory can be minimized. Instead of manufacturing something, what if I'm running a service process, such as my process of answering emails? How would the above principles apply? For that, let me look at the reason why I am restricting my email answering period to a couple of hours every morning. Suppose that the mornings are when I am physically available in my office, with access to my computer and email, and with no other engagements. Once I begin my other engagements, it becomes quite a hassle for me to return to my office, turn on the computer, log into my email, etc., just to answer one or two emails at a time. Given this inconvenient arrangement, the setup cost for my email answering process is quite high. Therefore, I decide to amortize this large setup cost over an entire day's worth of email. Instead, suppose I modify the process so that I can easily access my email via a handheld device. I no longer have to return to my office. I now have a mobile email answering process. With this convenient arrangement, my setup cost is considerably reduced. I no longer have to batch my emails for an entire day, but can deal with them several times throughout the day in smaller batches. Notice that with either of the above arrangements, I am still handling the same total number of emails every day. With the mobile arrangement, however, my process has much lower inventory levels. A lower inventory level translates to a quicker response time and a shorter line of students waiting, in proxy, in my inbox. With regard to my mobile email answering process above, there is another important setup cost that I must also take into consideration. Although I have now hastened my ability to switch into my email answering process, I still have the problem of switching back out of it. That is, I now have the problem of getting my concentration back to my other process that was interrupted. Depending on the nature of that process, the switching costs could be enormous. For example, if I'm in the middle of teaching a class, the switching costs include a botched class and unhappy students. If I am grading student papers, switching costs include distractedness and three extra hours of grading. If I am focused on a research paper, switching costs include a missed conference deadline or a rejected paper. If I am in a meeting with the dean, switching costs include a reprimand. If I am driving somewhere, switching costs include death and dismemberment. Once I factor in these switching costs, I decide to avoid switching into my email answering process which means I must inventory any incoming emails. Clearly, multitasking is not free. As we can see from the above example, whether we are talking about a manufacturing or a service process, inventory management principles can be applied to better manage the process. No matter whether we have an inventory of physical items, or customers in line, or customers' proxies in an inbox, we are talking about inventory. To reduce this inventory, I need to reduce the batch size. In order to do that, I need to first reduce my setup cost.